In 1878, Benjamin Disraeli, Earl of Beaconsfield, returned from the Congress of Berlin in triumph. He had checked Russian expansion against the Ottoman Empire, kept the Mediterranean secure and taken Cyprus as a prize. The popularity of the Tory ministry and the patriotic imperialism it espoused had never been higher. Yet in 1880, the party would go down to a shattering defeat at the general election, with Beaconsfieldism, as former Liberal Prime Minister William Gladstone dubbed the government's foreign policy, bringing about the catastrophe. Two campaigns in the aftermath of Berlin served to wreck the reputation of Beaconsfield and his government. Ironically, despite the fact he had little to do with either, the first was a campaign in Afghanistan, the second a war against the formidable Zulu Kingdom. Afghanistan had been a problem brewing for some time. Several invasions of India throughout history had come from the mountains of this mysterious tribal land. By the late 19th century, it was feared that Russia may be the next empire to exploit such a route. In 1878, supposedly against the Afghan emir's protests, they sent a diplomatic mission to Kabul. In Simla, the Viceroy, Lord Lytton, was outraged. He feared that the Russian presence was a precursor to some sort of alliance between the Tsar and Amir, one that could only be pointed at the subcontinent. A staunch advocate of a forward policy in India, meaning active and if necessary aggressive actions to secure the empire's borders, Lytton determined that Britain must respond by dispatching its own diplomatic mission. Once again, the Amir warned that he would not receive the envoys, and this time block their entry into his country if necessary. The result was bound to be a ratcheting up of tensions, not entirely unwelcome to Lytton. In London there was less alarm. Although annoyed by the Russian mission, no one seriously thought it was the forerunner of an imminent strategic advance in the area. This was almost certainly correct, as it seems the Russians had no real idea about what to actually do with its envoys once they arrived in Kabul. They certainly were not thinking of a war with the British after exhausting themselves against the Ottomans so recently. Nonetheless, Beaconsfield and his Foreign Secretary Lord Salisbury resolved to send a diplomatic protest to St. Petersburg, asking them to explain. This, they believed, was a satisfactory response for the time being, ordering Lytton to put on hold his plans for a mission. The Viceroy ignored this and dispatched Sir Neville Chamberlain on the 20th of September to cross into Afghanistan via the treacherous Khyber Pass. As the Emir had warned, he was firmly turned back at the border. Lytton declared it an insult and grossly exaggerated the situation in his reports to London. Salisbury, who felt the Viceroy was forcing his hand, was more than annoyed. Even Beaconsfield, who had chosen Lytton as Viceroy and long defended him, now felt he couldn't be trusted to judge the situation accurately. But they were trapped by the international prestige the government had staked its reputation on. Either backing down or recalling Lytton would have been a humiliation. Salisbury said it had never been British policy to stir up sedition against a lawful ruler who was neither misgoverning nor apparently even threatening British interests. But he was outvoted in cabinet, which now agreed with Lytton that military action would have to be taken. An ultimatum was dispatched demanding the Emir receive a British diplomatic mission. When no answer was received, the Indian army invaded on the 21st of November, 1878. Despite the farce that had led to the war, the campaign itself was executed flawlessly. Roberts routed a larger Afghan force and then took Kabul in early January. Lytton felt himself vindicated when the Emir's correspondence was captured, which had indeed been extremely friendly with the Russians. This, however, had not been of much help to the Afghan monarch, for Petersburg's envoys were withdrawn at the start of the invasion and the only assistance offered was a recommendation to seek terms with the British. In the end, Sher Ali fled to Turkestan and died in February. He was replaced as Emir by his eldest son, Yakub Khan, who in May 1879 agreed to a peace treaty which ceded the Khyber Pass to India and placed Afghan foreign policy in British hands in return for a subsidy. Had the crisis ended there, Beaconsfieldism may have claimed yet another triumph, despite the Prime Minister's reservations about the whole conflict. Instead, in September, the British diplomatic mission that had remained in Kabul was massacred by mutinying Afghan soldiers. Previously, there had been serious disagreements in the government over war. Now, there was only utter fury, the formerly Dove Salisbury going so far as to suggest that every senior Afghan officer be put to the sword for allowing the massacre. 
This time, the campaign went less smoothly. A humiliating defeat was inflicted on the British in July 1880, and it required another brilliant march from Roberts to secure the country once more, for yet another Amir. Although victory in an acceptable arrangement was eventually arrived at, the Conservative Ministry was by that time out of office, the damage having already been done. In spite of the Amir's friendliness towards Russia, the ultimate issue of her envoys was really a minor one, and Salisbury was right that the problem ought to have been settled with St. Petersburg directly, rather than Kabul. In Blake's words, posterity has correctly judged the Second Afghan War as unnecessary. Had Afghanistan been the only conflict, Beaconsfieldism might have avoided its unfortunate reputation. But yet another disobedient proconsul was about to land Britain in yet another war. For many years, British statesmen involved in the affairs of the Cape Colony had sought some kind of federation in South Africa, a la Canada, particularly encompassing the large population of Dutch-descended settlers known as Boers. Working towards this goal was the policy of the High Commissioner, Henry Freer, and for it he had in 1877 annexed the bankrupt and under threat Transvaal. The lack of resistance had left Freer feeling confident and he next sought to break the power of what was viewed to be the final roadblock to South African Federation, the Zulu Kingdom. This mighty warrior state had since the Great Trek seen skirmishes and wars with the Boer Republics, and following a humiliating Boer defeat at the hands of the Pedi in 1876, tensions had again been ratcheting up before the British annexation. The Zulu king Setuayo was a shrewd ruler and had little interest in fighting Britain, though certainly Frere later made the case that even had he not pushed for war in 1879, the logic of the king's policies and hopes for rolling back Boer infringement on his lands meant one must surely have occurred. We will never know if he was correct. What we do know is that on 11th of December 1878, he dispatched an ultimatum without cabinet approval that was clearly designed to provoke a war with its absurd demand that the Zulu army disband. Unlike Afghanistan, the British met with almost immediate disaster. At Hisan Luana, an entire British column of 1,300 men was wiped out. When news of the defeat reached London, even the usually serene Beaconsfield was distressed. This great disaster has shaken me to the centre, he complained to Lady Chesterfield. There was little choice but to accede to the commander, Chelmsford's request for reinforcements but it was an expensive business at £5 million, and was again another needless shedding of blood. Even though Chelmsford would decisively crush the Zulu army later in the year, and bring about the country's annexation, there was little rejoicing or prestige to be gained. Even strategically the war did not really make sense. The Boers had been facing conflict and probably defeat at the hands of the Zulu in 1877. Whilst this threat remained, they would be more open to a British presence. Sure enough, within six months of the Zulu defeat, the Transvaal had revolted and more than three years worth of money and energy spent on restoring the country's finances and stability was lost, though again the Conservative Ministry was by this point out of office. Although in both South Africa and Afghanistan Britain was ultimately victorious, the effect of the debacles was to convince the Liberals, and Gladstone in particular, that foreign policy could serve as a rallying cry for the 1880 general election. Pioneering American campaigning techniques, Gladstone toured the Midlothian constituency he was standing in, delivering speech after speech attacking what he called Beaconsfieldism. Disraeli's foreign policy, charged the former Prime Minister, was provoking unnecessary, expensive, and most unforgivably of all, immoral wars. Instead, British policy should be founded on Christianity, justice, and the concert of Europe. They were noble sentiments, but the reality was that nobody, least of all 19th century statesmen, liked moralising blowhards. Gladstone's foreign policy was destined to burden Britain with far greater problems than Beaconsfieldism at its worst ever did. In 1880, however, the public was receptive, and the first majority Tory administration since Peel was swept away. 